Pierre Lagrange is a portfolio manager at GLG Partners, which he co-founded in 1995. Now a member of Man Group, GLG manages more than $30 billion. And of course, that success has made Lagrange one of Britain's top 10 wealthiest hedge fund managers. That's according to the Sunday Times Rich List. My colleague Mark Barton is at that conference and is with Pierre Lagrange right now. Hey, Mark. Mariam, hi. Yes, I've just whisked away Pierre Lagrange from a panel, a panel on maximizing investment opportunities in China. And he's, uh, he's with me now. Pierre, thank you very much for, for coming down to us today. You talked on the panel about, to use your words, extraordinary opportunities in China. What are these opportunities? Just give our viewers some of the opportunities that GLG is looking at right now in China. Well, thank you. Uh, um, I guess the, everybody on the panel was in agreement that uh, the, uh, the 12th plan from the government was uh, paving the way for a lot of opportunity on the consumer side. And we had uh, extreme confidence in the long term uh, planning of the, uh, of the government. And I was last week um, in Beijing uh, precisely for that to do more due diligence on a couple of industries specifically. It was uh, a big CLSA conference where a lot of companies were and take um, e-commerce, for instance, or uh, one part of the internet. You know, the, the growth uh, of this business over the next five years can easily be estimated at 75% per annum. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, um, business to consumer sales, it's 0.2% of retail sales in the country. In this country, in England, we are at 7%. In America and Japan, we are like between 3 and 4 So you can see how uh, there's going to be extraordinary opportunities for the companies that are going to be able to harvest that. How do we, though, as maybe individual investors, expose ourselves to, to that type of growth? Do we have to go through you, through GLG, or what's the best way for us of ex to, to expose ourselves to you know, the types of growth in, in internet companies in China? Well, there's plenty of them which are listed uh, in America. Uh, which were uh, in the early days, uh, it was the best way for these companies to be listed uh, compared to the Chinese domestic market. Now, I suppose if they were starting again, it would probably be listed in China directly. Yeah. But that gives you an access uh, to, uh, uh, to those companies directly. Another way, if you don't want to choose between which one are going to be the winners, then obviously funds like, uh, or strategies like some of the GLG uh, strategies, like in technology, for instance, are, um, are going to be uh, quite helpful because then you get a diversified portfolio. You talked in, in, uh, during the panel about renewable energy, which we'll come to, but interestingly, you talked about art, about the relationship between China, China and art. and that's a possible avenue to make money. Just elaborate a bit more on that. Well, in, in all our portfolios, we've always been trying to extrapolate uh, from the very strong growth of uh, wealth and uh, the rising wealth of people in China and looking at European companies that can benefit from the luxury angle, which is rather obvious, but then also looking at American companies like Sotheby's, uh, where we see that the proportion of Chinese clients in Sotheby's revenue is already very, very big. And uh, it's growing extraordinarily. And it's a question of, do you expect less rich people on this planet and less rich people from China? And do you expect rich people from China to have any different way of behaving than when Americans became richer after the war? Uh, there's no reason. And therefore, that's another way to invest uh, on a same Chinese domestic thematic, but through an American company. And renewable energy, which I touched on, China is the biggest investor in the world in renewable energy. How do we take advantage of that? Well, Jason Mitchell, who runs our sustainability uh, practice, had a very good quote that in China, the norms light and investment heavy compared to the rest of the world because there's so much dependence on, uh, uh, on energy and uh, so much drive for energy efficiency. So you've got solar companies, you've got uh, power generating companies. It's less, diff it's less easy to single out one single uh, company, mm. but more a portfolio of companies which are going to be beneficiaries of focusing on energy efficiency. And we've got quite a lot of that. Pierre, I want to get to matters closer to home. And Europe is a big focus, of course. You run the European, the GLG European Long Short Fund. And we all know what's happening in Europe right now. The focus is on this sovereign debt crisis. You can long stocks, you can short them. What opportunities have presented themselves to you as a manager in the last 12, 13 months since the onset of this, of this sovereign debt crisis? 
Uh, it's interesting because my trip in China was actually really started by a um, desire to do more due diligence for European companies. You know, years ago it was really a question, that's where the demand comes from. And uh, European companies are big beneficiaries of those. And I think the European sovereign crisis, uh, which is very difficult to analyze, mm. uh, it's really more on the risk management side. How do you immunize a portfolio from which way this is going to develop? And then in the meantime, you put more of the risk on uh, businesses and companies which are less dependent on that, on the resolution Give of the crisis. Give us well, examples. Well, German machinery, yeah. uh, luxury good exporters, um, efficiency companies, uh, which are going to be big beneficiaries of demand worldwide and going to be less uh, vulnerable to a, a sovereign, um, you know, a, unwinding of, uh, of, of But issue. you can take a bet on both sides of, 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 of the scenario. Let's say Greece defaults. What are the implications of that for you and your thinking when it comes to Europe? What are the ramifications of a Greece default? I think, you know, there's been a lot of speakers on that specific subject. I think the ramifications are uh, enormous and difficult to analyze. So for me, from a portfolio management point of view, if I find opportunities in uh, other areas where I need to focus less on that, that's where I'm going to go. You know, when I look at luxury good companies or retail in England or uh, German machinery companies, um, I don't have to focus on the Greek sovereign situation in order to be able to make money for people. So that's a much better way to utilize the risk in the portfolios. Asset allocation, final question. GLG has funds which of course are in all asset classes, focusing on all areas of investment. Right now, when we just think about asset allocation, what's the balance? What's the balance between equities, currencies, bonds? Just give me a quick, give me a quick, quick answer. We don't function like that, and I, I won't give you a quick answer okay. because we've got numerous of funds who are catering for uh, every kind of asset uh, that people want to invest in. And uh, I would say that a lot of risk assets are still uh, relatively cheap. Such as? Uh, such as, you know, European equities, for instance. If you take on a short term, uh, it's very difficult to have visibility because of the sovereign crisis. If you take on a medium term, it looks very promising. Other risk assets which are cheap? Give me an example. Uh, some of the emerging market currencies, which are still benefiting from current account surplus and uh, good fiscal positions. Uh, um, and um, yeah, that's two that I can think of right yeah, now. Yeah, I wish we had more time, but thank you very much You're indeed for, for chatting to us today.